Good evening and welcome to UPARS Los Angeles. My name is Steve Murillo. I am the director for UPARS LA. Um, it's January 2018, Happy New Year. And uh, we have a great uh, program in, in store for you tonight. Uh, Christopher O'Brien. Um, I was first introduced to Christopher O'Brien through his book, The Mysterious Valley. And uh, I was new to ufology at the time. And uh, I read this book and it was actually phenomenal and groundbreaking for me. Um, I've come to know Chris over the years, and uh, he's a fine gentleman, but he's also a very, very serious researcher and probably um, knows the most about uh, the cattle mutilation subject in, in the United States. I'd say he is the, uh, the leader, the expert. But in addition to uh, cattle mutilation, Chris has studied uh, other paranormal phenomenon in the San Luis Valley, which is in Colorado. Uh, he spent 10 years there uh, researching strange phenomenon, weird things that uh, he'll talk about tonight, hopefully, um, but in, in addition to uh, cattle mutilation. But uh, some of you may not know, he uh, was one of the first guys to actually um, bring the Skinwalker Ranch out into the public and do research there. So he was in direct contact with the rancher and his wife and knew all about that before any of you guys or uh, any of us knew about it. He was, he was the man on the scene. And uh, that, that ranch is, is actually, uh, that's a weird place because I've been there and strange things do happen there. Uh, Chris has written many books on the subject of um, the San Luis Valley. There was, uh, mis uh, um, Valley. thank you, Secrets of the Mysterious Valley and uh, Enter, the Val Enter the Mysterious Valley and then uh, Stalking the Herd. But oh, by the way, I didn't tell you, I read um, Stalking the Trickster I read that uh, when I was in Jamaica recently. I, my wife and I were there, and that's the book I chose to read while I spent a week. And it was a good book, great book. Um, but tonight he's going to be talking about something that this is my particular, my pet peeve, this, uh, this subject of uh, cattle mutilation. And the reason uh, I, I find it interesting is it's, it's one of the few types of phenomena that leaves behind physical traces that you can actually measure. Um, we don't know how, how it happens. But what we can do is actually measure or see, uh, you know, the, the mutilated body of the cow or whatever the uh, animal happens to be and, uh, and study it. Um, it doesn't always present the same way. There are other phenomena that happen around or surround the phenomenon, uh, such as batteries draining when you get too close, can't use your cell phone. Uh, you know, the thing, there's no footprints and it's in the snow and, it, and broken bones look like it was dropped from on high. Um, sometimes you see black helicopters, but are they really black helicopters? We don't know. No one's ever been accused in all the thousands of cases. No one's ever been thumb, uh, fingered as, hey, you're the guy that did this. No one's ever been seen or accused, taken to a court of law, that uh, they're the person that's doing this. Um, but I'm uh, glad to have Chris back. I guess it's been, it's been too long. It's six years. And I'd like to have him back here like once every year or so. So uh, without any further ado, if you guys would put your hands together and welcome Chris O'Brien. All right, Happy New Year. How about those uh, LA Rams? They almost did it this year, man. I was rooting for them and doing great. They're going to be great next year. Um, yeah, it's been too long. It's been actually, I think, to the day, six years since I've been here. Um, this is, I think, my fourth time or... I think my first time here was in 98. And um, it's good to be back. And thank you all for showing up. And um, special shout out to uh, uh, you, Par, and, uh, and the group here. Thank you so much, you guys. Uh, I really like that you've opened up um, your focus. And it's not exclusively just uh, weird things that are unexplained in the sky. I think Steve brought up a very good point that uh, most, if not all, of these so-called paranormal phenomena have some sort of connecting point I think that they all have interrelationships with each other. Um, I think more, as, we, as time goes on, more and more serious researchers are starting to, um, to really get the point that, uh, that these, the, all these apparently divergent phenomena are actually uh, related on, on some level. I am going to be zipping through a lot of material tonight. Um, you know, bear with me. I'm going to take questions at the end. Um, I, I really need to, to, to dash through everything, though, because it's, so we're going to be covering a lot of ground. And uh, as, as Steve mentioned, I, I did 10 years in the San Luis Valley. And I, was, you know, I wasn't just uh, looking for dead cows or weird lights in the sky or, or structured craft. 
I was also looking at aberrant social behavior, weird weather patterns, and the correlations that happen when waves of activity um, unfold. And if there's cattle mutilations, then chances are there's strange military activity and UFO sightings. Um, I've even had outbreaks of, of trooping fairies and small elemental forms. Um, we've had unusual fires, unusual amounts of roadkill. Um, I, I note all that stuff. I think it's all part and parcel of a overarching uh, connective tissue, if you will, between all these things. And this is me before I got involved, my, my innocent, you know, pre-weirdness uh, researcher self. Thank you. And uh, I'm in a shaman's cave. Now, what I did do over 10 years is I put together a database uh, that's got 10 points of data in order for the event to be in there. I have over 700 events. Um, if you know, if all the stories that grandma told me or the neighbor told me or, you know, no dates, no times, that sort of thing, it, it wasn't included in the database. So um, I do have uh, all that online. It's been publicly available ever since day one. This is the book that, um, that I have in the back there that, that chronicles what it's like to go through 10 years of investigating all this weirdness. Uh, and it includes for the first time the story of my relationship with Lawrence Rockefeller and having uh, been funded for two years by, by Rockefeller. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I kept that a secret. I, I didn't want people to, to think that I was some brown nosing uh, spook or something. People think I was part of the problem and I'm not, I trust, trust me. Um, the, the unexplained animal death phenomenon. Oh yeah, my disclaimer, I have never worked for and do not plan to work for the government in any capacity. I am a, I am a public individual all my data is available to anybody that wants it. If you're a spook with the DIA or the CIA, you're, you're welcome to my material. If you're a, a, you know, a, a junior high school kid wanting to do a paper, you're welcome to my, uh, my database and all my data. We're gonna be covering a bunch of stuff tonight. Um, this is not only a talk about cattle mutilations, it's a talk about our 30,000 year relationship with cattle. Um, we have, <laughs> when you start researching the religious structures based around cattle in ancient man, all the way to the present time in India where they wet nurse ca calves that are uh, orphaned, um, we have an incredible relationship with these, these amazing animals. And uh, it's gotten so incredible that it's become detrimental to the environment. And that's what we're, we're gonna be ending up with. But we're gonna talk about our ancient relationship with cattle. We're gonna talk a little bit about animal sacrifice. I don't have too much time, but there is a connecting point between the mutilation mystery and animal sacrifice. I'm gonna um, highlight some San Luis Valley cases that I personally investigated. Um, a number of them were uh, quite high strange. Out of uh, 200 cases, 40 of them were, were definitely done with, uh, by design with intelligence. And about eight of them really that just freaked me out. <laughs> so we'll look at a couple of those. We'll look at worldwide cases. Uh, this is not something that just happens in North America. Right now, for the past oh, 10, 12 years, uh, South America has, has been inundated with cases almost weekly. Um, we just had cases uh, about two months ago down in Patagonia, all the way at the bottom of the planet. Um, we're gonna look at some bizarre cases. These are always fun, you know, animals found mutilated in trees, that sort of thing. Um, we're gonna look at, quickly at some theories. Linda Howe, I'm sure, has been here and, and talked about the five to 7% of the data uh, that involve UFOs. Um, we're gonna look at all 100% of the data tonight. Um, I'm gonna look at some of the debunkers. Um, you know, I think some of the debunkers are correct. I think mm -hmm. uh, once the media gets involved, uh, people, every dead cow out there is a mutilated cow if you don't know what you're looking at. If you're not a vet or a veterinary pathologist or someone like me that's been trained, um, there is a bunch of uh, cases I think that have been lumped into the real mystery that shouldn't have been, that are just mundane scavenger action, unusual looking, but mundane. We're gonna look at some of the perpetrator's agendas. Uh, we're dealing with not just one size fits all, uh, a, a single perpetrator here. We're looking at multiple groups that are doing this. And we're gonna look at some of the, um, some of the agendas and how, how they uh, evolved. And um, we're gonna look at some correlations and, and connections. This is my, where I have fun. This is where I got uh, <laughs> Lawrence Rockefeller to start sending me money because um, I started talking about connecting points and correlations. And uh, that's always fun. And then uh, we're gonna come to a conclusion. Are we dealing with sacred cows or are we dealing with hooved locusts as the Native Americans called cattle when they first encountered them? And then time permitting, uh, I probably won't be able to get into it tonight, but I'm putting together the first fully uh, operational scientific monitoring program 
in the San Luis Valley with triangulated cameras, um, detect motion, record on motion um, uh, equipment that allows all the cameras to swing around and focus on a single event. We're gonna have recording gravitometers, recording magnetometers, radar, everything else. Um, it's uh, pretty exciting. I'm gonna be doing a GoFundMe campaign here pretty soon. So let's move on here. I'm talking too, <laughs> too much. Did you know that over uh, 68 cattle are slaughtered every minute in the United States? That's, that's over one a second. Or that Americans consume over 5 billion hamburgers a year and McDonald's alone uh, buys 1 billion pounds of, of beef. Uh, cattle are the largest source of freshwater pollution in, in North America. They're also the main reason why we're cutting down rainforests to make room for more cattle. Uh, they're the, the largest uh, causes of the creation of deserts, of new desert land. Uh, they're the second largest natural producer of ozone depleting gas, methane. You know what the largest producer of natural methane is? Termites. Go figure. <laughs> um, 80% of the antibiotics that we use in this country go into cattle. 60%, almost 60% um, of the growth hormones that we use go into cattle. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking why, about why that is. And 70% uh, of the grain that we consume in the United States is consumed by cattle. And that grain alone could feed every hungry person on the planet. And that's two billion starving people on the planet. Um, they're responsible for the largest uh, percentage of, of hormone use, as I mentioned before. And then I don't even want to talk about the billion tons of organic waste that they produce, but that's why our groundwater in many places in the country is becoming trashed with E. coli and other things. Whenever you hear of a spinach, you know, spinach uh, outbreak of E. coli and spinach, is generally a feedlot has, over, has been flooded and has uh, gotten into to the irrigation water. And, uh, you know, we could talk about anthrax and rinderpest and black leg and foot and mouth and mad cow disease. <clears throat> We're going to hit that one big time later. Okay, moving right along here. Okay, if we look quickly, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, the darker the color, the more meat the uh, people in the country eat. So the United States and, and Argentina have the most, or uh, uh, Australia have the most. Um, Argentina, Brazil are a little bit behind. You'll see in Africa, they don't really eat much beef. And in, in, uh, in parts of um, Southeast Asia, they don't really eat much beef, but in Europe they do. And um, obviously in Russia, uh, and Mongolia eats a lot of beef, as you can see here. Um, but it's interesting that the countries that have the most cases of, uh, of, of mutilation reports uh, are Christian countries, number one. You won't find any mutilations in non-Christian countries, uh, which I find interesting. Um, you also won't find mutilations in, in countries that uh, have a very low per capita amount of beef uh, consumption. Another thing that I found very interesting in India, where cows are sacred, um, we're going to talk about this a little bit. Um, I have a really interesting fact about, uh, about the sacred Brahma cattle of India. I have yet to find a single case of mutilation in a Brahma cow, calf, steer, or uh, bull. Uh, the sacred cattle of India have a, a get out of jail free card. And there's millions of Brahmas all over the world. They're not just in India. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, we, all, we get a lot of stuff out of cows. I mean, it's not only, you know, for food. Um, it's anti-aging cream, medicines, pasta, imitation eggs, coke, dyes and inks, adhesive uh, medicines, laboratory receipts, deodorant, shaving cream. Just look at the list. There's thousands of things that we, we use uh, cattle to uh, produce. Gelatin, uh, the hooves of cattle will go in to make, uh, you know, pills, uh, gelatin capsules fertilizers, uh, cosmetics, hormones, enzymes, medical materials, refined sugars, charcoal, fertilizer, the list goes on and on. So um, cattle have become very, very important. And our relationship with cattle goes back 30,000 years to the first artistic renderings that we know of by man. Uh, you know, if you go to places like, uh, like Chavez, Lascaux, um, places like that, you'll, you'll notice that, you know, Altamira. Um, these, these are some of the earliest uh, artworks done by humans uh, all the way back 30, 35,000 years ago. And many of them were of ancient aurochs, which were these giant, huge paleo cattle, uh, pre-domestic cows. 
Um, Orox uh, stood 10 to 12 feet at the shoulder, so a person would be about this tall. They're, they're the size of, of a rhinoceros. Um, when Julius Caesar encountered them, uh, he wrote in, in his book, The Punic Wars, that they, they were the size of small elephants, but they were really nasty. They had very, very bad um, the, the temperaments and dispositions. So imagine, <laughs> well, first, here, before we get too far down, a French uh, genetic study was done about seven, eight years ago. And they took samples, uh, DNA samples, from all 947 breeds of cattle that have all been domesticated from a single herd, as they found out, a single herd of cows, 80 animals, in um, northern Iran uh, 12,500 years ago. So all the domestic cattle of uh, you know, the European variety, not the, not the sacred Brahma cattle, those are uh, Bas Zebu or uh, Indicus, and, and the Zebu strain, it's the uh, Bas European and, and Primavis. Uh, those are the cattle um, that we're all familiar with, the Herefords and the Jerseys and the Angus, um, all those kind of cows, the Charlays. Um, there's 947 different breeds, and they all are derived from a single herd of domesticated cows that were somehow um, contained uh, by ancient man 12,500 years ago. Now, we're talking, again, 10, 12,000 wild animals, these 10, 12, 000, 10 to 12 feet uh, uh, tall, huge wild animals. And to try to contain one and steal their, their young must have been quite a feat. And I find it ironic that in the same uh, part of Iran that these cattle were finally domesticated, mm -hmm. and it took about 1,000 years to really you know, start producing docility into these animals. This is where we first uh, see uh, wine making and beer making. So maybe it took alcohol and uh, to, to give these guys, to embolden them and to give them enough uh, guts to go after these animals and try to contain them. I, I just find that, that con I, I'm always looking for connections uh, here. Uh, so th there's one for you. Now here's something, I really like this. Uh, you're gonna love this. This is in Somalia. This is called the Lascaux uh, frescoes. Now look at these animals. This is 5,000 years ago. And these animals, uh, you see how big they are in relation to the person and see how they're, they're adorned. I think that there were elaborate rituals where they would adorn the cow to try to uh, entice the bull to breed with that cow because they're trying to you know, breed in docility. So the most docile cows were the ones that they wanted the bulls to breed so that they could keep breeding in docility. And if you go through here, they're all dressed up. I mean, you can't really see it that well, but, but they're dressed up in clothes, some of these cows, and they have garlands and, and, uh, and necklaces and all this very fancy uh, regalia. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's, uh, it's, it's, if you really dig into it, it's really interesting how much work it went into uh, over thousands of years of, of breeding uh, docility and, and other traits into cattle. Um, of course, the oldest story known to, uh, to the Western world is the story of Gilgamesh. And one of the main tenets of the story is that he, he uh, is trying to, to cut down the tree of life with his friend Enkidu. And uh, what does he do? Uh, the gods send down the bull of heaven to dissuade him, and he kills the bull of heaven. So even in the earliest story, you have a uh, man uh, having uh, this weird kind of relationship with cattle. Well, here's one for you. I've been looking for the earliest depiction of a mutilation. And here's one that's uh, between six and 8,000 years old, I believe. Let's see, there it is. Look very carefully at what's going on here. Now you have to understand, this is a fresco. The, the, the cattle herd goes all the way back 20 feet. I could only fit this par portion of them on. But look at what's going on here. And you have a leg missing, you have a little ghostly character Looks like an alien gray who's uh, working on the animal's uh, front section here. And I have a close-up here. Or I think I, I used to. This is the close-up. You can't really see it that well, but there's a little figure here. Um, you can see it much better in the book. But it looks like an alien gray, and he has some sort of weird uh, instrument in his hand. And he's working on the face of the cow. Now, I'm, I'm going on the assumption that everybody knows what a cattle mutilation is, right? Everybody knows? Yeah, I'm just, uh, we'll get to that in a second here. First, let's continue with our history lesson. Okay, let's, uh, let's go holy. 
Cattle were domesticated in the Near East. Well, worship of the cow went to the east into India, and worship of the bull went to the west into the Minoan civilization, Greece, Rome. The Mithra cults, which was the competing religion to Christianity uh, in the third century BC to the first century AD. Um, in India, there is a Krishna has a cattle aspect. Um, sometimes he can be a cow, sometimes he can be human. You'll notice that he's uh, getting, getting his uh, little snack here. Well, turn, turn about is fair play in India when cows are orphaned, uh, little calves, uh, women volunteered to, to, to uh, wet nurse them. Um, if a cow wants to walk into your home in India, you are legally obliged to let it. Cows can go anywhere and do anything they want. And it is one of the, the greatest uh, crimes in India to harm a cow. <laughs> yeah, so go figure. Um, you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, the in, uh, all these traditions, the, the, the bull uh, acrobats in, in uh, minnows and uh, kenosis in, in the Minoan civilization, they would leap over the bulls. Um, their civilization was totally based on cattle and uh, bull and cow worship. Then you have uh, the Egyptian god Hathor in her, uh, with her, um, her lunar aspect and her cow aspect. Here's a good uh, depiction of the size difference between an auroch and a person. Um, the auroch, again, is the, is the progenitor species to uh, domestic cows. And here we have uh, your typical daily uh, cat cattle mutilation. Cattle are mutilated every day uh, in the millions, and animals are sacrificed to the gods every day in the millions uh, around the planet. I don't have time to go into that, but Santeria, Condomble, there's a, a, quite a number of belief systems on the planet that, um, that use uh, the sacrificial blood of animals for their religious practices. Um, so are we dealing with uh, sacred cows and hoof locusts? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Okay, what is a cattle mutilation? Chris, what are you talking about here? I mean, we all kind of remember back in the 70s if, if we were around back then. I uh, have an older crowd, so most people probably remember that in the 70s, um, it was the biggest news story in Colorado in 75. Uh, thousands and thousands of animals were being reported. We, we have, in my database, in my book, uh, about 10,000 cases, I think, were were officially uh, uh, documented and, and uh, reported uh, all through the 70s. And, and generally, a classic mutilation, which is a term that you'll hear Linda talk about and others, is when the tongue is missing and the mandible flesh is gone and the, and the, the jawbone is bleached white. Um, that is a classic mute. Um, you can't duplicate that. Even if you take that jawbone and boil it in a lye solution, you cannot um, duplicate that that bleached like it's been lying in the sun um, you know, effect. Um, and then one or more of the following organs are generally taken, either the, an eye or uh, both eyes, an ear, the male genitalia, the female re uh, reproductive tract is taken out like a plug. Um, oftentimes there's a patch of, of skin missing, whether it's circular, triangular, rectangular. It's not a tear, it's a cut out patch. Um, and all these excisions, uh, these organs are gone, uh, and all these excisions appear to have been performed with expert uh, precision. And that's where you hear surgical, uh, the word surgical a lot. You hear, um, um, there's some things like laser cuts that you hear sometimes and drained of blood. Um, these are not really common. Um, out of all my cases uh, that were tested, and I, I think I tested around 40, uh, 35 uh, to 40. Only two came back having high heat as a cutting agent. So that's, I think that's kind of rare. Um, most of these animals are not drained of blood, contrary to popular belief. Uh, many times I've gone out and the rancher says, they drained my Bessie of blood. And I'll say, here, help, help me out. And we'll take it and we'll flip it over. And of course, gravity sucks all the fluids down to the bo bottom of the body cavity. And when you flip it over, whoosh, everything comes spilling out and, and you kind of show the guy that, hey, your Bessie was not drained of blood. Um, so I know we're gonna get a little graphic here, so kind of bear with me. I'm, I'm trying to keep the blood and gore down to a minimum uh, if possible. Um, one of the things that I was really intrigued by is uh, where is the oldest documented case uh, of a livestock, uh, unexplained livestock death? And I found this uh, <laughs> reference in the the court records of James I of England right after he got, uh, got into the throne. And on the 10th of February, 1606, there's the following entry. The minds of men are much troubled with a strange accident lately fallen out. 
which yet by no means can be discovered about the city of London and the adjoining shires. Whole slaughters of sheep have been made, in some places to number a hundred, in others less, where nothing is taken from the sheep but their tallow and some inward parts, the whole carcasses and fleece remaining still behind. Of this sundry conjectures, but most agree, it tendeth towards some fireworks. Now that is probably the most enigmatic description of a, a wave of livestock deaths that I've ever encountered. And you gotta remember what was going on then. James I was beginning to rewrite the Christian Bible and remove all references to the bull. Because the, the original Bible had tons of references to the bull. Aaron and Moses were competing priests of, of bull cults in Egypt, uh, for instance. He takes out all references of the bull. Shakespeare is finishing up Macbeth and is going into dress rehearsals. And Guy Fox had just been torn to pieces uh, 10 days before when they were trying to hang him and he jumped off the scaffold and uh, broke his neck and they, they drew and corded him and sent his body parts around the realm. So it was a pretty exciting time in London and you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sheep being mutilated. So anyway, I, I wish I had one of those, you know, you know things, but I don't. Uh, anyway, okay, shooting ahead. I, in my book, I have a whole chapter that looks at cases from the uh, 1700s, the 1800s, uh, into the early 1900s. There were um, cattle and sheep being mutilated in Ireland in the early 1800s. Uh, in the early 1900s uh, in Australia, there was a whole outbreak of cattle and sheep mutilations in New Zealand. Um, so the, the main case that I'm gonna be talking about is the Snippy the Horse case, which is the very first publicized case. That was the first case that became internationally famous. But prior to that, and that was in 67, but prior to that, there were a number of cases, and anybody here that's read Charles Fort will notice that there's a number of cases in um, his books, Low, Wild Ta Talents, and, uh, and um, what was the other one? Craig will know. Low, Wild Talents, and, uh... okay, well, it's, he's got a third book. Anyway, there was an, a case in 1897 that I found very intriguing. Uh, Jerry Clark, the eminent uh, ufologist, debunked the case and said that the guy, Alexander Hamilton, who was a, uh, um, you know, the pillar of the community in Yates Center, Kansas in 1897, said he was a member of a liar's club and this was all a big hoax. Well, I did his, I did the research and looked up the, the footnotes that he cited and found the original articles and he made all that stuff up, <laughs> I hate to say it. Uh, it was a real case. Uh, 12 members of the community uh, um, actually signed notarized affidavits to his honesty. Um, the case uh, is very peculiar. He uh, was in his barn. He heard a commotion outside. It was the middle of the day. He saw his son in a ranch hand struggling, trying to free a calf from a barbed wire fence. And he ran out and then the, the, the calf broke free from the fence and flew away. It was, it was at the end of a rope that was going up to this huge airship that was flying over and the airship had evidently somehow lassoed the cow, the calf, and, it, and the airship flew away with the calf uh, bawling at the end of the rope. Two days later, they found the calf mutilated about two miles away and uh, he reported it because he was, he, you know, he, he was pretty freaked out. I mean, there were no airships back then. This is before the invention of the Zeppelin and, and uh, you know he had heard about the, the great airships uh, that were being seen, but this one took his, his darn cow and he was gonna do something about it. And so he announced it and, uh, and he was so uh, adamant about it. He was the county uh, constable. He was the chief law enforcement officer of the county besides the sheriff. And he resigned his position as constable to, to devote more time figure, trying to figure out who these people were. Well, this, this, this story went around the country and Jerry Clark dismissed it and said, oh, there's nothing to it. This, he was a member of a liar's club, which uh, was a story that his son came up with about 40 years later. Um, and, you know, we, we, I am looking at the case as a real case. So go, <laughs> go figure. Now, Steve mentioned that no one's ever been uh, tried and convicted of, a, of a, a mutilation. That's not true. This guy was tried and convicted in 1902. His name was George Adalji. He was a Hindi Christian minister in England. Uh, was in the same town that Nick Redfern grew up in, uh, the investigator and researcher I'm sure you all are familiar with, uh, Nick Redfern. 
And uh, George was convicted of horse slashing, although in Charles, Charles Fort's book, he calls him a cattle mutilator. So that's the first use of the term cattle mutilation I can find is uh, Charles Fort calling George Adalji, who was convicted of horse slashing, calling him a cattle mutilator. Go figure, there's a weird cow horse thing that we're gonna be surfing along with all, all, all evening. So anyway, George uh, Adalji was, was sentenced, put in jail. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the guy who wrote Sherlock Holmes, uh, took up his case because he realized that there was, you know, pretty sensational, and he looked into the investigative techniques that were used uh, to, to get him sentenced and, and charged and convicted, um, and found out that it was very shoddy police work, had a retrial, was able to raise enough of a fuss and, and get publicity, and there was a retrial, and he was found innocent. So, uh, go figure. When you do some digging, sometimes you, you come up with some pretty cool stuff. <laughs> well, I thought it was cool. I'm a nerd, but what can I say? So there's Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, how many people here can remember what was going on that first weekend of September 1967, that the end of the summer of love? Remember that? Especially around here and in California. I mean, it was a big deal. You know what else was going on that weekend? Oh, special effects. Watch out. You had a mass awakening and an expansion of consciousness, and you had probably more people at one time tripping on psychedelics than any other time in history. And where do psychedelic mushrooms prefer to grow? Yeah, exactly, isn't that interesting? Another connecting point here. You know, I'm always looking for the connecting points in the uh, correlations. So on September 7th, during the height of the summer of love, 1967 in the San Luis Valley, about 60 miles south of where I lived for 13 years in the 90s, the King family um, were running cattle and running horses on meadows where some of the earliest known evidence of man in North America are found. Uh, the cattle guard site is very famous, almost 13,000 year old uh, traces of uh, Folsom man and uh, incredible Clovis points and uh, mastodon uh, skeletons just within sight of this site. Uh, Nellie Lewis had a horse named uh, Lady and uh, Lady didn't come in with the other horses uh, for, to get fed and watered. And so her brother Harry, who was the, the head of the ranch, kind of the ranch boss, he went out looking for her. And he found her missing all the flesh from the tip of her nose all the way to her shoulders in a ring around her shoulders where a collar would go. And all this flesh, tissue, hide, connective tissue was vacuum cleaner off the animal's uh, skeleton. And this is about about a month and a half later, so it's, it's turned dark, but initially it was a ghostly white color, uh, like it had been bleached in the sun, all the bones, and then it slowly started to turn pink. Uh, the upper respiratory, you know, the, the lungs were gone, the heart was gone with no break into the chest, the brain was gone with no break into the skull, and uh, when I was a 10-year-old, I was with my mom at a Safeway in Bellevue, Washington, where I grew up, and I remember seeing the National Enquirer and they had this picture and that headline, flying saucers killed my horse. And of course I bugged my mom for the 25 cents or whatever to buy it. And I devoured that magazine boy. I was, whoa, flying saucers are like taking out horses now. Are we gonna be next, you know? And that's where I first learned about the San Luis Valley. And uh, so it kind of always put a bug in my ear and wouldn't you know, in, in 89, just by accident, I ended up moving there. So, I don't know, how many people have heard of Dr. John Altshuler? He worked with Linda Howe for a number of years. He was a, an eminent uh, um, uh, hematologist up in Denver. He was visiting the great sand dunes, which are these huge piles of sand, about 49 square miles of sand, that are about 20 miles from the Snippy site, uh, just north of where Snippy was found. And he says, claimed he was abducted that same night. And when he came out of the dunes, uh, one of the rangers started talking to him and found out that he was a hematologist, uh, you know, was studying hematology. He was uh, in his residency um, at the hospital in Denver and said, hey, we have this weird uh, dead horse. You want to come take a look? And he did. He, he did. He was the mystery pathologist, well, mystery doctor that actually did a, a an examination of the animal. And... Uh, 
he swore he would never come back to the San Luis Valley again until I coaxed him back in 94 and we almost had a mid-air collision while he was flying his plane and then he definitely never came back. Uh, hey, uh, Snippy's available. Anybody want to buy Snippy? Snippy's for sale. Uh, she disappeared. The bones were articulated by a local vet and uh, the bones disappeared for about 20 years and then somebody found them in a, in a railroad car with some guy's collection and so they, they, they drug it out there and the fan, there was a big tussle over who owned it and stuff. And then finally, uh, the, the owner said, well, we want to put it up on eBay. So they, they put it up on eBay for auction uh, for $18,000. I mean, who would buy a horse skeleton? I guess some Japanese guy that wanted a cool lawn ornament or maybe a, for a tie rack or something, or I, I don't know. Uh, the, the highest bid was 1800. So if you want to buy Snippy, I can, I can turn you on to the people that own them, and I bet you I can get you a good deal, too. Seriously. Um, some other, another case or two that happened that same weekend that you don't know you hear about when you hear about Snippy is uh, several bison were mutilated that weekend. Um, I haven't been able to dig up too much about those cases, but uh, there were other cases that happened that same weekend. And, of course, horses and bison were the most important animals to the Native Americans. And the, the mountain that sits right to the east of where Snippy was mutilated is the sacred mountain of the east to the um, Navajo, to the Diné people of Blanca Peak. Um, and they do blessing uh, there every four years. Um, and right about that time in 67 was when they stopped doing the blessing, which I, I find uh, kind of interesting. And I've, I've done some digging into that. I don't have too much time to go into that, though. Um, um, the... Aerial Phenomenon Research Organizations, Jim and Coral Lorenzen came and investigated the case. They actually wrote a little book called Death of an Appaloosa. Um, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, one of our first abductee researchers and, and hyp hypnotherapist um, uh, working out of the University of, uh, of Wyoming. Um, he also uh, did some regression work on Nelly um, and investigated the case. One of my real mentors, Tom Adams, who unfortunately we lost uh, three years ago, and uh, his sidekick, Gary Massey, they were uh, two of the first investigators um, in 1969 and 70. They went there. Tom Adams uh, took me under his wing when I first started out and taught me how to research properly. Uh, I owe him a, a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude. And also, Linda Howe. Linda Howe taught me how to interview people. And um, she's a very, very good interviewer. Unfortunately, Linda is absolutely convinced that aliens are coming down and gathering genetic material uh, to hybridize their race and, and has kind of got blinders on maybe. She only looks at a, a small percentage of the data uh, and, and um, the data that kind of supports that particular uh, theory. Again, I, I'm trying to be more open-minded about it. Um, my first case actually was very interesting. I, when I first uh, <laughs> started looking into all the weird stuff in the San Luis Valley, I, I heard about UFO sighting that uh, my little town had experienced, and about 18 people out of 150 people saw this, uh, two huge 100-foot uh, ovals come down out of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains and then hover over the town and take off one night. Actually, it was Thanksgiving 1992, Thanksgiving Eve. I was away gigging with my band, so I missed all the excitement, but I gave a New Year's Eve party um, a, a month later, and uh, at one point, everywhere I went in the party, it was about 30 or 40 people, uh, a sizable percentage of the town showed up. It was a good party, too. Um, everybody was talking about these UFOs that, that quite a number of people had seen. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this would be a great article for the newspaper. So I, I started interviewing everybody, and I said, wow, you people realize that you all saw probably the same thing? And so I went to the publisher of the Cresto Eagle and said, hey, I've got a great idea for an article. And she goes, okay, make it 500 words, and, and we'll print it. And I was going to, you know, have fun, say all the, the uh, retired hippies all had a, a collective acid flashback, or, you know, there was uh, somebody slipped some, some uh, psychedelic into the water. I was going to have some fun with it and do, and do those things that, that the media does that we all hate now, you know. And back then, I didn't know any better. And so I had two weeks before I had to turn in my article, and so I started to research the subject, you know, remembering Snippy, I found the owner of Snippy was still alive, the, uh, the husband of Nellie Lewis. I, I went to a bunch of county sheriffs. I went down to the head of the sociology department at Adams State. And within a week, I had enough material for a book. 
And I was totally blown away. And instead of a 500 page tongue in cheek article or 500 word, it was a 1500 word serious article. And wouldn't you know it, it was picked up by you know the AP and Reuters and UPI. And I got inundated with requests for information from around the world and was on TV in two months. Uh, just like one of those weird things. Um, so ever since then, um, I, from 92 to 2002, as my database uh, will show, I, I put in um, 300,000 miles uh, in six years on my truck um, and <laughs> interviewed thousands and thousands of people and, and shot a lot of video and stuff. But my first case was uh, from a handful of photographs a local sheriff gave me when I first uh, contacted him in 92, 93. Uh, that first week of 93, he said, you know, do we have any cases in Sawatch? And I'd already talked with Tom Adams, and Tom said there were no official cases in Sawatch County, which is where I lived and, and where Crestone was. And he showed up a couple days later with a handful of photographs. And the photograph that I'm showing here is of a bull that was mutilated in the town right out 12 miles from, from Crestone. So, you know, it was, a, it was the closest case. So I called up the rancher and said, hey, Remember that bull that was mutilated in June 1980? And they said, oh yeah, we do. And I said, well, can I come out and talk to you about it? And so I went out there and interviewed him and they said, yeah, it was weird. When we were sitting down for dinner, we heard this helicopter and this, this MASH helicopter with no, you know, like with the gas tanks outside. And as it turns out, it was a Bell UH-47. It flew you know, mustard yellow in color. It flew right over their house and, and it seemed to land out in their pasture. Well, they didn't think much of it. You know, there's really nothing out there except their cows. And so then 20 minutes later, they heard it fire up. And this is right around sunset. And so they ran outside because it was coming back the other way and it went right over their house, 40, 50 feet up. And they got a really good look at it. There were no identifying numbers or, or uh, uh, any sort of uh, logos or anything on it. And so they thought it was weird that it was landed out in our pasture. They went out the next day and they found their bull uh, mutilated. Uh, and all the flies that landed on it died which is weird. There's all these dead flies in some of the photographs. Well, I'm sitting here 13 years later uh, interviewing them about this yellow helicopter, and I go home to type up my notes. The next morning I wake up and I'm, I'm having coffee and I'm typing up my notes and I hear this thump, 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 thump. I look out my window and here comes a U, U-47 mustard yellow flew right over my house. And I'll tell you, you heard a bear rabbit and a tar baby? I, I got that tar baby stuck to my face now. I, had, I mean, I was hooked. I mean, I just instantly knew that we're dealing with something infinitely more complex than the simple explanation of aliens coming down to gather genetic material to hybridize their dying race. Uh, that's why I wrote a book on the trickster. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that if we have time. Well. I went out to Virginia and I told her this and, and she, she freaked out and said, you're kidding me. And I said, I wish I was, I have five other witnesses. And I said, can I go out there and see where the, where the cow was? And so she took me out there and 13 years later, there's the cow on its back, you know, it's melted into the ground. So I said, can I have the skull? And she said, sure. Well, here's the only painted mutilated cow skull probably in existence, whatever. You can see my thinking at the time, you know. Anyway, I painted it yellow, of course. And there's a UFO with a, a red lightning bolt because she had mentioned red lightning in a storm around that same time period, whatever. Hey, it's a tough job, somebody's gotta do it. The ancient mariner had a dead albatross around his neck. I have a dead cow around mine. And uh, unfortunately, that New Year's Eve party when people were all chiming in about, uh, about this UFO sighting, on Thanksgiving, somebody else said, oh, that was the same night there was a cattle mutilation down two counties south of us, um, which from my porch I could see, because I could see almost 300 miles or 150 miles in either direction. And so um, again, that's kind of that tar baby thing. Uh, the correlation was uh, too good to be true. Um, in that 10 year period, I investigated uh, around 200 cases. Um, if I had to pick my least favorite thing to do in life, it's to, to investigate a dead, necrotic, rotting cow. Uh, thousands of pounds of rotting animal flesh is not fun. You have to put Vicks vapor rub under your nose. Um, there were several times my girlfriend wouldn't let me come in the house. I had to take you know hot or cold uh, you know hose baths outside. It's really nasty and disgusting. 
but somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to really look at this thousands of pounds of physical evidence and see if we could figure something out. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we found out. Um, here's some cases. Uh, this is, you know, people say, well, it's always the upside organs, the upside eye, the upside ear, the upside mandible that's taken. No, it's not. Notice this animal was laying on its face, and here's the, the mark on the ground from where it was mutilated with its face down. A predator or a scavenger did not do that. Um, here's a case that was very interesting. Um, this was the only white horse in a herd of 15 bays and chestnuts. This was a wintertime case, very rare. And the heart was taken with no break through the rib cage. You can see the hole there. And the thing that I look for first when I go out on a case is for cut hair follicles. Um, coyotes can't cut hair. Insects and birds can't cut hair. And when you see a straight line of cut hair, somebody with intelligence or something with intelligence did that with a sharp implement. Okay, that is, and I'm, these new investigators that have been around the last 10 years, I keep telling them over and over and over again, look for cut hair, look for cut hair. And they're like, <clears throat> right over their heads. And if they would do that, the animal tears the flesh and it tears in between the hair. The hair is not cut. Only a sharp cutting instrument can cut hair. Coyotes have really bad breath, but they're, they're not, they don't have bad breath that's, bad enough to be a barber. They can't cut straight lines with their breath. Um, this case really freaked me out. Um, this animal was found in five inches of snow, freshly fallen snow. Uh, the right front leg was gone. The rib cage and spine were gone, very unusual. The brain was gone with no break in through the hide or into the skull. Uh, the liver and the heart, the two main organs that scavengers go after were carefully surgically excised and laid side by side in the body cavity. There was not one drop of blood in the snow. There was one drop of blood on the rear left hoof of the animal. That's the only blood we could find. This animal was drained of fluids. Um, the spine was broken in an upwards motion and because the hide covered the spine, it was physically impossible to do that. The animal would not rot. I went back uh, a week to 10 days later. Um, I think I went back a couple times, but um, the animal was being kept in a heated garage on plastic and it, it, it didn't smell. And when I put my nose really close to it, I smelled a very similar smell that was described around the Snippy case, a medicinal smell, like a real, very faint, but strong very strong molecules, there weren't very many of them, but they had a smell of like a, a, a medical perfume. Not formaldehyde, not disinfectant, but, but an antiseptic kind of smell, but, but musky and pungent. Um, the, the two uh, separate uh, individuals uh, reported strange lights in the field the night that this happened, uh, unbeknownst to one another. This was uh, probably my strangest case. I sent temp, uh, tissue samples to uh, the New York State Veterinary College. Uh, Dr. John King, who was the head of the college, was my skeptical tester. And uh, there were only two cases that he uh, uh, found results that he couldn't explain, and this was one of them. He says that this was not an animal that did this. It does appear to be some sort of sharp cutting instrument, but I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that this animal was mutilated by, you know, by sharp cutting instruments, but wink, wink, that's the only thing that could have done this. So this was a very important case. Uh, the brain was brain case was perfectly dry. This, the, the thin film, I forget the name of it, that goes around the brain. Yeah, the dura. There was not one shred of the dura even, uh, which connects the brain to the brain case. Uh, it was medically impossible. This one freaked me out. Um, We've all heard occasionally, if you read the papers, uh, weird individuals in England like George Adalji in 1902 slashing horses. This still goes on in England. There's also a group of people that sexually uh, attack horses in England. I don't know what it is with the Brits, but uh, they need to get some people over there that need lives, I think. <laughs> anyway, I've been dovetailing my efforts with uh, David Caton, uh, Tony Dowd, uh, Richard Hall's kind of standoffish, but uh, 
also Philip Hoyle in the animal pathology uh, field uh, unit, APFU. Um, they've been doing a lot of good work on the boundary between Wales and, uh, and, and the rest of, the, of England, um, from Shrewsbury down to uh, the, the Radnor Forest. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of sheep over the years since the 80s have been mutilated there. Some of them uh, uh, actually live, they, they live through the mutilation. There are no predators there. Um, so you can't blame this on coyotes or wolves or um, predatory birds, that sort of thing. Um, they do see a lot of these though, and um, these are kind of ubiquitous with the, um, the cattle mutilation phenomenon, is the mystery helicopter. Tom Adams, uh, who I showed a picture of before, uh, wrote a small book called The Choppers and the Choppers, which lists out uh, 350 helicopter reports around in and around mutilation sites. So for every UFO or weird light that's seen, there's dozens of helicopter sightings um, that have been seen in other cases. So, you know, when Linda and some of the, uh, the proponents of the alien theory talk about UFOs, they never mention that dozens and dozens of cases of, of helicopters um, you can find for every single UFO type report. And another thing that she, she doesn't talk about is that there have been dozens and dozens of mutilations where the animals have been killed with, with, with gunshots. Now, I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong, but aliens don't hurl small pieces of lead at uh, hypersonic or subsonic velocities, to my knowledge. Anybody ever hear of an alien shooting a gun? When I asked Linda about all the helicopter sightings, when I invited her to, to be a part of my book, which I invited all the investigators who were still living, many of us are dead, and some mysteriously too, I might add. Um, she said, well, I said, well, what about the helicopters? And she said, well, those are just UFOs pretending to be helicopters. And of course I said, well, kind of Occam's razor, Linda, you don't need to make it more complicated than it is. I had a sheriff and two deputies that you know, they, they almost brought one of the helicopters down with their with their 30 hot sixes and their <laughs> their sidearms. They said it started smoking and making clanking noises, and they doubted that it was able to get back to Fort Carson, where it seemed to be headed. Um, so, you know, I beg to differ. Um, you know, and again, I do owe Linda a great debt of gratitude for for um, you know scarfing up all my cases for about six years and you know training me to to interview people correctly, um, but. Uh, you can't argue with now over 400 helicopter sightings in and around mutilation sites. That's in this country. In England, it's even more. Uh, it throws the number up. We've had some oddball cases. We had a, 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 a truck driver in Kansas just driving along, and he saw a creature that resembled this on the back of a cow. It had something coming out of its, uh, a tube coming out of its head, and it was sucking up fluid from the, the back of the neck of the cow. And it freaked him out so bad, he became a, a devout Christian and became a minister. Um, I show this picture. It's the closest thing I could find to the description that he gave. This is some weird creature that was discovered uh, in uh, Pennsylvania in a cavern. They still don't know what it is. Um, so we have had some pretty, pretty strange cases. Do horses climb trees? This was a, a case of a horse that was found uh, with a you can see the head is here, and here's the back legs and the front legs. This is a 1,200-pound Morgan, a huge draft horse, and it's sitting up uh, hanging in, in a tree. Uh, it wasn't mutilated, but uh, the rancher said there was some strange goings on. His dogs were freaking out that night, and he went out, and there's the, the horse that asphyxiated itself because it was, it was collapsing its lungs uh, by being up in the tree. And he said there's no way it could have jumped up there. Here's a javelina. There are no javelinas anywhere near Colorado. This is up at, at 7,500 feet. Um, the valley, the San Luis Valley is way up in the air. It's the largest alpine valley in the world. And here's a mutilated javelina about seven, eight feet up in a tree. I had uh, one of my investigators who was driving along and he saw a pig up in a tree and he goes, I've never seen a pig like that. And I said, that's a javelina, it's a pecker, pecker, type of peccary. And there, there's none even close to you. They're in Arizona. <laughs> yeah, go figure. You know, what's, a, what's a javelina doing in the mountains? You know, uh, Here's a deer. You can see the hole in the septum. This went directly through uh, the septum, and you could see light uh, in the other side. It was mutilated, and it was found up in a tree. Of course, the ranchers that found it drug it out of the tree to see if they could salvage the meat before they took pictures, which kind of ticked me off. Um, 
many of you have possibly seen this shot, which is touted as aliens dropping a mutilated deer onto a, onto a uh, power pole. This actually was an animal that was hit by a train and knocked up there. So, all right, now you knew it was coming at some point. So if you've got a really squeamish uh, uh, disposition and you don't wanna see a human mutilation, uh, close your eyes, I'll tell you when, when it's okay to look. This is the Girparanga Reservoir case from 1988. Yes, this man was found mutilated like the cows. Um, the mandible flesh uh, was exposed, his eyes were gone. The hole in the crook of the arm is where the heart and upper respiratory organs were taken out. And his belly button is where the lower organs were taken out. We won't talk about his genitalia. Okay, it's okay to look now. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is where I kind of have to, you know, put my foot down. Especially in the cattle mutilation realm, the extraterrestrial hypothesis has been doing an alien stomp on creative thinking in this field for decades. And also, I think, in the field of ufology as well. I think that there's, um, there's room for um, other alternative theories. And I always like to remind people that we owe it to ourselves to exhaust all earthbound possibilities and uh, you know scenarios before we have to jump off planet and think we're special enough for anything out there to come to this violent, primitive, unevolved uh, planet that uh, still has a long way to go spiritually. And uh, unfortunately, because of the media, the extraterrestrial hypothesis has been running roughshod over creative thinking in this field all the way back to the 40s. And that's my little gif for you. Um, what role does the media play? Uh, the media is the, is, has tremendous power. You know, I've been on over 70 TV uh, segments. Um, I have dozens of shows from Unsolved Mysteries, uh, UFO Hunters, Inside Edition, Extra. I could go on and on, Ancient Aliens, all these shows. You know, I've worked you know, in front of the camera and behind the camera. And I'm constantly reminding myself, I have to be not only careful of what I say, but be careful how I say it. And what you have is a lot of film students walking around without any knowledge of the subject matter, being asked to research subjects that they have no background in. And you have directors and producers that are concerned with selling advertising time and satisfying network executives. How can we possibly rely on the media to be our educator when it comes to high strain subjects that academia and the scientific community refuse to, to address? Do not believe your television set in any way, shape, or form. Not only in this realm, but politics, religion, uh, you know, anything having to do with the culture. Culture, as Terrence McKenna liked to tell people, culture is not your friend. Okay, culture is everything that you don't have to do, that you don't have to believe in. And so I've, I've been on a bandwagon here and uh, with uh, my friend Ted, Ted Bonnet here and, and other filmmakers. We're part of the conscious media movement. We're trying to move this whole shooting match forward and do it in such a way to be intellectually honest, not over sensationalize and dumb down the subject matter, to be honest and to be accurate with what we're saying and how we present this information. This is terribly important. Most people think that the, the event is what's important. And, and Ted and I and Greg Bishop and, and, and others in the field who are th you know, thinking a little creatively, we think that the experiencer is more important than the experience. And um, you know, I, could, I do a whole talk about that, about the role of the media and connecting points within culture. I have a whole talk, which I've never actually given here, so next time I come back, I might, I might uh, grace you with that one. Um, I think it's really important to take everything with a grain of salt. Coast to Coast, Jimmy Church, um, you know, these shows are there to, you know, have demographic uh, results for advertisers. They're there to uh, put listeners, uh, you know, uh, on, the, on the, you know, to the show and, and put butts in the chairs at conferences. Corey Good, David Wilcock, these people with outlandish stories. If it sounds too good to be true, it is, okay? Be discerning people, really. Don't believe this stuff. <laughs> we talk about, 
you know, the, the Steve was talking about this soft disclosure that's going on. This is all disinformation. I mean, gun camera footage, there's thousands of gun camera footage and they're whipping out this stuff and they make it, they actually make the quality less than it is so that they're not giving away the, the actual quality of their sensing equipment. Those things have been, have been sanitized and scrubbed, those two uh, footage uh, clips that they released. This is, all, this is all part of a disinformation campaign, people. And I'll bet anybody any amount of money that uh, Tom DeLonge and those guys are just there to like, watch the right hand while the left hand is playing with your tush, you know? Anyway, now I'm getting off my soapbox. I, you know, I'm really getting tired of this. I love this lamp, though. Uh, this is great. And, and my co-author for my next book, David Perkins, who I'm going to talk about here in a second, I got him the last one. Uh, it cost me a fortune shipping it from Australia. But this meme of, of UFOs beaming up cattle, you see it everywhere now. And, and where do the cattle go? What, what happens to the cows? Are they abducted? Do they return them? I mean, I'm seeing this everywhere. Look at it. I mean, you, you can't escape it. But I want to know, what are they doing with the cows? Of course, are aliens gathering genetic material? Why don't they just pick the lock on a slaughterhouse and they can get all the genetic material they need? Why do they have to sneak around in Farmer Brown's pasture and pick on poor Bessie, his best breeding cow? It's something about that just doesn't, doesn't make sense. I love this. Now, this is, they're letting the cows come back now. So the, the, the meme has is, is done a complete full circle. Now we have the cows coming back and the ranch is going, Martha, check it out. Here's Bessie on her way back. Oh boy. Well, David Perkins, again, this guy, you want to hear stories. He was George W. Bush's roommate. He lived in the same dorm room with him his freshman and sophomore year at Yale. Boy, he had some stories. Oh, I could do a whole talk just on that. Um, David is one of the brightest people I know, um, one of the most creative thinkers I know, a very, very, well, my closest friend. Um, he was invaluable in uh, researching Stalking the Herd, my book. Um, and also, I'm, we're doing a book together that analyzes all the data in Stalking the Herd. Stalking the Herd is all the data, okay? It's 12 different databases that have all been collated together. Um, Stalking the Stalkers, or Mute Speak, I mean, we've got a couple of titles in mind, is going to analyze all that data, and we're, we're well on our way through, through that, and hopefully next year it'll be out, um, or later on this year. He was the first one in 79 uh, to come up with the idea that we're, we're looking at environmental monitoring. And what he noticed was if you overlay a map of above ground radiation in the environment with a map of mutilations, you come up with this very interesting uh, parallel. You can't really see it that well uh, in this image because it's not the resolution isn't good, but anywhere you see a red dot, is an area of high incidence. That's not a, a single case, that's a lot of cases. And you'll see, you can see these faint blue dots. If they say U, that's where we mine uranium. If they say N, that's where we utilize it, whether, we we whether it's a weaponization uh, factory, a nuclear, uh, re a nu a nuclear reactor or power plant, or um, someplace where maybe a missile field with uh, nuclear warheads. Um, so, it's interesting that wherever you see the use of uranium or the mining of uranium, if you go downstream and downwind, that's where you find the areas of highest incidence of cattle mutilations. Now, David noticed this years ago. Now, it's been 40 years. And uh, so I'm wondering, because of Fukushima, if we're not at some point going to start seeing some mutilations west of the Rockies. There are very few mutilations in California, Oregon, Washington, um, Arizona. One of the reasons why I moved to Arizona is because they don't have mutilations. And so I don't have to go drive two and a half hours to, to sit there and poke around in a stinky, rotting cow. So uh, seriously, that's one of the reasons literally why I moved to Arizona. And interestingly enough, the 12 major cases that they do have on the record happened the month before Travis Walton was abducted in the same area of the state, <laughs> within 40 miles of the uh, the site where the you know his famous abduction occurred. We have uh, a dozen mutilations in the month of October 75. 
So anyway, David noticed that there's a correlation between, um, between the use of uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear materials and, uh, and areas of high incidence of mutilation reports. The mutilation waves really peaked in 1975. We had as many as eight states a night uh, reporting mutilations. Um, Governor Lamb of Colorado called it the, the greatest outrage in the history of uh, cattle ranching uh, anywhere. It, it was also the number one news story in the Rocky Mountain states for 75. Um, thousands and thousands of, like I said, 10,000 uh, documented cases. It, it kind of peaked in 75 and then it, it, it went down a little bit and then it went right back up in 77, 78, 79. We had another big peak and then it went down again. And then we had a peak in the mid 80s. Um, then it petered out again. We had a little peak in, the, in, in down in Alabama in 89, 90. Then it went down again. Then we had a real major spike in the 90s uh, in Colorado, New Mexico. Um, we had uh, a couple of thousand cases, I think, uh, through the 90s. And uh, now, uh, starting about 2002, the cases disappeared completely. And all of a sudden, South America started getting nailed big time every night uh, back in 2002 to 2004. Almost nightly, mutilations were being reported in Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay. Right as soon as they eradicated hoof and mouth disease, as soon as the last animal was inoculated, boom, the mutilation started. So um, a little correlation here, uh, just to give you an idea. The only pollution known uh, near the San Luis Valley, which is considered the most pristine um, area in the lower 48 states uh, in the United States, it's completely surrounded by mountains. It's about 140 miles long geographically and about 70 miles wide. It looks like a football uh, shape. And uh, the only pollution that we have there is up at a Superfund site about 60 miles away up in the San Juan Mountains. And uh, this is the Summitville gold mine. And they, they screwed up in a cyanide leaching uh, uh, pool and it trashed the upper 17 miles of the Alamosa River. Well, um, in 1998, uh, 97 rather, the EPA, people say, why, don't the, why doesn't the government get, uh, get their own cows and rent their own pasture and stuff? Well, the government does, and here's an example of it, but it, it backfired on them. The EPA sent a scientist named Brian Rimmer right down into the San Luis Valley where the Alamosa River uh, was okay, allegedly. You know, 40 miles upstream, it was trash, but then it cleans itself as it, as it gets down to the valley. And once it, it gets into the valley, all these canals come off of it to help water crops and provide water for ranching operations, water for the towns. And uh, so what they did was they rented uh, pasture there and they raised cattle and sheep uh, for 90 days, they you know let them graze uh, along the Alamosa River, and then Rimar took took them uh, by truck to uh, the laboratory, the EPA laboratory. They they mutilated the animals, they cut them up, and they they analyzed the tissue. Well, what he found was horrified him. There were 300 to 600 times the the uh, amount of heavy metals. Uh, that were supposed to be in the animals, be, probably because of the bad uh, leaching uh, and heavy metals leaching down into the river. And uh, he said some of the animals shouldn't have been alive. They should have been killed uh, from uh, poisoning. And so he went to uh, his superior and said, look, uh, these, these results are, are really uh, troubling. We need to warn the ranching community and the farmers about this. And they said, no, you don't. And he said, what do you mean? These people are eating this. They're, 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 they're eating the crops. They're eating the, the, the meat from these animals that are grazing off this, these water sources. And they said, we don't want to alarm anybody. You, you are not allowed to say a word. And so he quit and sued them. <laughs> because he, he, was, he said, I, I'm not going to be quiet. He became a whistleblower. He went to Westward Magazine in Denver, which is the, you know, the kind of the... I don't know, sort of progressive, sort of investigator magazine up there, an art magazine. And he did a big um, expose about it and came, you know, came clean with it and horrified a lot of people in the state. Well, isn't it interesting? During the time period they were doing the tests between 94 and 98, um, most specifically 97 and 98, all my mutilations happened on the Alamosa River, right here. His, his uh, ranching operation was here. And all my mutilations, except for one up here, were along the Alamosa River. 
Oh, it's a coincidence, Chris. Come on. I don't know. I, I think that gives some teeth into the idea that there's somebody, at least the EPA, appears to be monitoring the environment. And if the EPA is, maybe the cattle industry is monitoring the environment. Maybe other branches of the government, the CDC, the National Institute of Health, Maybe there's other people that are monitoring the environment using the tissue, soft tissues of cows to see if there's something in the environment that could be detrimental if it gets into the food chain. Okay, the soft tissue organs that are excised are the quickest regenerating organs in the body. And they're also, they have the most recent vestiges of their environment contained in the tissue. So if you wanna find out about above ground radiation, about bad water, about pesticides, fertilizers, those types of things. You can take the tongue out and you can take uh, some of the uh, soft tissue organs out, the mammary glands, the genitalia, and you can find uh, all sorts of things out about the animal's environment. So you know, we're starting to zero in on this a little bit. How am I doing on time, by the way? Are you guys uh, bored yet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, in, I, remember, I mentioned in 1989 uh, and 90, um, Alabama had a big wave of about 100 cases. And uh, Ted Oliphant uh, was convinced that uh, helicopters were coming down from Kentucky, from Fort Campbell, and they were uh, spraying um, animals with bacteriological weapons and then mutilating them to, to see the effects of the bioweapons. He was absolutely convinced. He had a whistleblower that, that, uh, that went to him and said, that's what's going on. Um, he also... Um, uh, worked with me on the book and supplied me with uh, his database from Fife, Alabama. Um, I found a cult sign at a number of cases, uh, which is pretty rare. Uh, back in the 70s, all the newspaper articles uh, that you would see on the mutilations were Satanists blamed for cattle mutilations, occultists blamed for uh, dead, dead cows. And I, I, I traced back where that connection occurred, come to find out that J. Allen Hynek, and Jerry Clark, back in 1971, they found two guys in a Texas penitentiary that said that they were Satanists and they, in their group that they were affiliated with, were the ones doing the mutilations. And they said, well, we'll tell you, you know, when they're gonna happen and, and where to go and who these people are, if you give us a reduced sentence and let us out of maximum security uh, prison. And so they went with them and of course they, they were just pulling a fast one, you know, telling a tall tale. They could not back up any of the information but Heineck and Clark had uh, Donald Flickinger, who was a, an officer with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, had him write a memo to, to warn county sheriffs to be on the lookout for cultists who are mutilating cattle. And it was sent to every county sheriff in the country. So we have ufologists to blame for the occult animal sacrifice meme that's in culture. <laughs> I find that kind of interesting. Um, it, I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version. It, the, the story is, is actually, oh, oh my God, what happened? More special effects, I guess. Um, I did have a case where animal parts were found in a, in a plastic bag hanging over the animal and there was a, a candle on its uh, head, a lit, you know, had been a lit candle. It was out when I got there. Uh, imagine the little kid that found that. He was picnicking with his folks. He went out to take a leak and, and found this. And it probably scarred him for life. Uh, so there, there, there are some cases uh, that could be laid at the doorstep of ritual occultism, but there, there, there are very few and far between. Are you getting a, a hint that there's more than one answer here? Just starting to kind of get a little bit of a ring to it? Well, the debunkers, of course, they had a field day with uh, the whole thing. They said, oh, this is just uh, unnatural looking scavenger action. People don't know what they're looking at. These are predator kills. Animals get hit by lightning. Um, you know, all sorts of explanations have been put forward. When, uh, how many people here know of Gabe Valdez? Does that name ring a bell? He was the, the head uh, of the barracks for the New Mexico State Patrol up in northern uh, Rio Rebus County in New Mexico, where Dulce is. And uh, Gabe investigated uh, 130, I think, cases up in the Rio Rebus uh, Sandoval County area, uh, many of them on the uh, Manuel Gomez Ranch, 
where he saw these weird helicopters and had all these, he found a gas mask and they found fluorescing paint marks on the back of cows when they ran them under a black light to see if they were being marked somehow and they found markings on some of them. Um, Gabe was convinced, of course, that this was all government. Um, but uh, because of the uproar in the New Mexico ranching community, hundreds and hundreds of animals were being mutilated. They petitioned the brand new Senator Harrison Schmidt who was, I think, the last man to walk on the moon. And Harrison Schmidt had a conference in 79 that was probably one of the wildest conferences ever. Uh, there was everybody from New Age uh, channelers to, uh, you know, hard, hard, you know, hard driven ranchers and, and pissed off lawmen. And, and uh, David Perkins does a good job. Uh, <laughs> he was the first presenter. Uh, he does a good job uh, describing the event. Uh, in, uh, in my book, Stock in the Herd, uh, in, the, in the introduction. But uh, Harrison Schmidt, uh, because he had the, the nerve to put on a conference like this, his uh, opponent in the next election used that against him and beat him uh, on that because he did that, that crazy uh, conference. Well, the, the following year, Schmidt you know, was able to talk the, uh, the DA of, of Santa Fe, uh, the, the five counties around Santa Fe, uh, to get a uh, $50,000 grant so that uh, the uh, next FBI agent could come out and do an official government investigation, which was uh, called the Rommel Report. Well, it's interesting, the six months that he was running around looking at cases, he actually sat in the car. He, he couldn't stand dead animals. So he had the other people doing the investigating. He would sit in the car um, and sleep. He only actually went out to the, the very first one. Well, all the cases moved to Saskatchewan and Alberta. They got inundated with cases uh, for the six months that he was running around looking at mundane cow deaths that had been scavenged by birds mostly and some coyotes uh, and foxes and other small animals. And he said, well, there's nothing to this. And it's because he wasn't looking at real cases. By then the media had got involved and every dead cow was mutilated because people who don't know what they're looking at get freaked out when the media is saying there's mutilations, aliens are coming down and mutilating cattle. My God, there's a dead cow. Holy crap, that's missing those organs. It's the same organs that, that, you know, they're soft, they're easy to eat, they're, you know, coyotes love genitalia. They love to, to you know, birds love to peck out uh, eyes and get into rear ends. I've seen magpies carve a perfectly circular hole in the rear end of a cow. Birds mostly are the scavengers out west here. So anyway, he's running around with his guys, looking at, at nothing. And so he, he you know, puts out his whitewash report in 1980, saying there's nothing to this, move, move, move along. And uh, Lynn Lauber, who was the chief investigator for the Royal Committee and Mountain Police said, yeah, I'd like to see him come up here and say that to some of the cases we have. They were finding barbiturates, nicotides, coagulants, anticoagulants, all these weird substances in these cows when they were doing, you know, they were doing uh, chemical uh, workups on them. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's funny how it works, you know. I had all my uh, vets in a row, and, and I was all ready to work with the National Institute of Discovery Science, NIDS, who had been dogging for five years. And I finally buried the hatchet and said, okay, I'll work with you guys. I had all my vets trained. I had all the money I needed to do all my testing and everything. I didn't have another case for seven years. <laughs> Coincidence, Chris, right? Okay. Well, there was a book that came out. The authors at the height of the mutilations uh, in 79, they were given $80,000, an $80,000 advance to write the book about cattle mutilations. You know, the Bantam books wanted them to come back saying aliens did it. When they came back saying, well, there's nothing to this, move right along. They only sold 4,000 something books and they had to burn the other 80,000 books or whatever that they'd printed. <laughs> <laughs> or pulp them. These books are very hard to find. I know Greg has a copy. Uh, these are very, very rare. If you find one, grab it for me. I've got two. I'm collecting them. Um, so how many cases do go reported? Um, the stranger the case, the more freaky it is, the less likely it is for the rancher to talk about it, to report it. Uh, he will take it off to a bone pile, or most often he'll bury it. Uh, the really freaky ones tend to be the ones that they bury, literally bury in the ground. Uh, some of them burn them. Uh, so the higher strange uh, the case is, the less likely it is to be reported. The cases that get reported are generally the ones where helicopters are seen. Then the rancher thinks he's being victimized by the government. 
because generally these are military helicopters, but not always. They've been reported yellow, <laughs> white, blue, you know, military, all of drab, black, um, you know, sizable percentage are black or, or, or dark green in military style, but not all. And um, so this is something that I've been struggling with for years is how many cases are we actually seeing? And both David Perkins and I think it's one or two out of 10 of these cases are being reported, okay? And that goes on for today as well. Um, here's Gabe Valdez in, in, in Dulce, New Mexico, uh, unsung hero. He was uh, quite uh, instrumental in my process. We lost him about six years ago, uh, five years ago. Um, that's his son, Greg, who wrote a book about his dad called the Dulce uh, Files, or Dulce Base Files, I think that's Greg back there. Um, He's an interesting uh, guy, DEA, I think, uh, agent. Uh, here's uh, uh, Dulce Bass is the name of the book here. And then Lou Girodo, who we just lost a few months ago, he was almost uh, 90. He was uh, the Los Animas uh, sheriff that was featured in Linda Howe's movie, A Strange Harvest. A uh, super nice guy, convinced that something high strange was going on. The Black Helicopter Mystery um, is not only, uh, you know, in the cattle mutilation realm, but it's uh, it's, it's, it's mentioned in abductions. It's mentioned in, uh, in some UFO sightings, uh, for instance. And uh, it's even become a, a buzz term for the media. When they want to talk about conspiracy buffs, they now call them the black helicopter crowd. And when I had Kevin Randall, a helicopter pilot in the Army, he was in Iraq even, uh, for, I think for the Iowa National Guard or one of the Midwestern states, I asked him, uh, you know, when did this whole helico black helicopter thing start? And he says, what are you talking about? You're the one that started it. And I said, what? What do you mean? He goes, yeah, you're the one. It's, it's, it's all because of you. And I said, well, Jim Keith wrote a book called Black Helicopters Over America. And he says, yeah, and you're in it, aren't you? I said, uh, uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so blame it on me. Oh, well. All right, connections. What's Chris, come on. What's going on here, buddy? Come, come, come up here, you know, tie all these threads together for us, all right? Okay. In, on October 17, 1996, a 13,000-acre blowdown event occurred on the Continental Divide west of Fort Collins, Colorado. Two million trees were flattened in less than five minutes. Within 10 days, mad cow disease in elk and deer called chronic wasting disease broke out in the deer herds and elk herds in this area. That outbreak has spread across the entire eastern half of the country. From New England to Georgia, all the way to the Rockies. 20 states now have chronic wasting disease as a result of the animals that developed in October 96, developed a disease. It has now spread to deer and elk all across the United States. Uh, there was pattern, there was patterning in this blowdown. There's one, I wish I could find it. One guy was able to film it when it happened. Um, the Forest Service is not allowed to talk about it. If you ask about it, they say, we don't know what you're talking about. I flew over it and I got some great footage, which, ended up going to <laughs> Lawrence Rockefeller. Um, anyway, my point being that I think nature warned us that this was gonna happen and the Gulf Stream decided to come down and kiss the earth. I, I know it sounds crazy, but I think Gaia is a super organism that is, that is sentient. I think it, it, it's, it's had enough with us and it's trying to warn us when, when things, uh, bad things are gonna happen as a result of our, you know, folly, if you, for lack of a better word. So here's where the blowdown event occurred. And then it's, it's spread all the way across the eastern half of the country uh, since then, and it's still spreading. Well, isn't it interesting, in 1976, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was given a guy named Daniel Guczek and he was famous uh, like for being a James Bond type guy, running around looking for weird diseases to bring back to the Army Chemical Corps at Fort Detrick. You know the cigarette smoking guy in the X-Files? 
That's based on a guy named Sidney Gottlieb, who was the head of the Army Chemical Corps at Fort Detrick all through the 50s, from the 40s through the 70s. Uh, Daniel Guchek found a weird disease in Papua New Guinea called uh, Kuru, which was a form of mad human disease because the 4A tribes people, where it occurs, would eat the brains of their relatives when their relatives uh, died. And so this, this act of cannibalism over generations made them susceptible for prion disease. Prions are, are little proteins that are a thousand times smaller than the, the smallest virus, which is the smallest life form that we know of. Well, well prions or prions, they fold. And when they fold, they cause other proteins to fold. And so it's a wave of folded proteins. And what they do is they create holes in your nerve tissue. So it's very similar to Alzheimer's. You, you start to forget things, you start to twitch out, and then ultimately your body forgets to tell you the heart to beat or the, or the lungs to, to breathe and you die, um, usually from pneumonia and from in invasive infections. Um, mad cow disease, um, Kutzfeld Jakob's disease, which is what uh, mad human disease is now known as, um, and scrapie in sheep, a chronic wasting disease in uh, deer and elk. Um, these uh, are 100% fatal. Once you get it, it could be up to a 30 year incubation. You, unfortunately, it's really not considered a life form because you can't kill them. If you burn a cow that has mad cow disease at 800 to 1000 degrees, most of the prions survive in the bone ash. They will last in the soil for up to five years. You need to burn them with 2,000 to 2,500 degrees in order to kill all, or you don't really kill the prions, you just make them inert so they don't do anything. They just kind of lay there. Um, that's a very good question. Um, again, there's a lot of conjecture about that, but they think it's when you eat the nerve tissue of your own species. Okay, now, kutzfeld jakobs disease does occur naturally one in a million people will develop kutzfeld jakobs disease naturally because of something in their genetic makeup. When I did my talk just before my book came out in, um, in Minneapolis, six people came up to me after my talk and told me they had a relative or a friend that had died of kutzfeld jakobs disease. We have seen a huge increase in dementia deaths, the same symptoms that you see in kutzfeld jakobs disease in advanced you know, full-blown prion disease are the same symptoms you see with dementia, Alzheimer's. We have a four to 5,000 percent increase in dementia deaths in this country. These people are not being autopsied, so they really don't know why they die. We may be seeing a silent spread of prion disease that we may be getting from beef. Okay, so moving right along, Daniel Guchek brings back these brains from Papua New Guinea in 1966. They go to the Army Chemical Corps, who then weaponizes it and sends it out to the Rocky Mountain Lab, which is in Fort Collins, right down the hill where the blowdown event happened. And it goes all also up to southern uh, Wyoming and it escapes into the Darren Elk herd that surrounds those areas. They were able to eradicate it, they think. They were able to stamp it out. They caught them all. Now, if you catch, if you shoot a deer in the Rocky Mountains and then east of the Rockies, you have to turn the head in to have it tested for prion disease. Now, most people don't know that. And I find it also interesting that the areas where these, uh, where these animals are developing prion disease are also the communities uh, that are the have the most militia activity and have the most patriotic ranching communities, which I find kind of interesting, and that's where they hunt. Um, so we're getting into some societal manipulation, I think, here as well. I have a couple of cases where big ranchers were hiring helicopters to go and mutilate cattle of their neighbors who refused to sell their ranches to him and so he used this as a terror tactic. You know, I, I eat beef. I'm not like Oprah. Remember when Oprah said in 99, I'll never eat another hamburger again when she had a show on Mac cow disease. The next day she was sued for $2 billion. 
And she beat the suit. It took her a year and a million dollars, but she beat it. But the beef industry is the most powerful lobby in this country that you never hear about. Okay? It's the largest income producing sector of agriculture by far. It's what's for dinner. Remember Robert Mitchum? Beef is what's for dinner. Um, I eat beef, okay? <laughs> Just, you know, I eat grass fed, hormone and uh, antibiotic free grass fed beef that's from a cow in my neighborhood. Okay, I don't eat imported beef if I can help it. Occasionally I'll break down and I'll have a steak, but it will be in a restaurant that has grass fed beef. There's only one fast food chain that has all natural beef and that's Hardee's and um, uh, Carl's Jr. They have an all natural antibiotic steroid free and a growth hormone free uh, uh, burger. And uh, it's not that good, but hey, if I had a choice, that and what's the other one? In and Out has good beef. They raise their own cows and stuff, supposedly, and process their own meat. So anyway, I'm, I'm kind of digressing here a little bit, but but I just want you to know that uh, there is a connection here uh, between these blowdown events. And I had one in Sawatch County uh, that was very interesting. And what, what was really bizarre, it was only about four or five acres, and it was right on the Continental Divide. You really can't see it that well in this here because of the, the, the lights are washing it out. But I had a archeologist come and check it out and tell me what he thought. And he said, wow, these things will lay down like a crop circle. And I said, yeah, isn't that weird? And so he and his buddies started digging. And inside the blowdown were tons of fulsome points. I mean, thousands and thousands of year old Indian artifacts. Here's Ken. And uh, as soon as they got outside of the blowdown event, there were no artifacts. Isn't that strange? They could only find the artifacts within the blowdown and within feet of, of, the, of the actual edge of the circle outside, there was nothing. So this is Ken near a, a giant um, terraformed snake that's 1,500 feet long. He's at the tail that they don't know how old it is. It's been there for several thousand years. It's the largest earthworks outside of the mound culture. And uh, the uh, Smithsonian is, is trying to kind of cover it up because they don't want people to know about it. But Ken's doing a big paper on it, so you'll hear about that. It's, it's really interesting. It's a 1,500 foot long stone snake that's been terraformed into the, into the hill in the San Luis Valley. I think random blowdown events are cool. Everybody loves crop circles because they have all those beautiful, you know, glyphs and stuff. Most of them are hoaxed. Don't tell anybody, but most of them are done by very talented humans. I think the ones that really need to be uh, looked into are these random blowdown events that we know are being done by nature. This may be nature trying to talk to us. I know, Chris, man, are you off your rocker? No, I really, I, I, I really think that nature, we're getting to a point now where nature is having to start to push back a little bit. But we do have, you know, speaking of crop circles, we do have evidence that strange circles have been seen in, in fields in England all the way back into the 16 and 1700s. Um, Lawrence Rockefeller, when I, I happened to just meet him, um, it's, a, it's a fairly long story, which I go into great detail in, in my uh, Secrets of the Mysterious Valley book. But uh, uh, I happened to have a chance to, to spend a, a, an afternoon and evening with him, and he, he had so much fun, he had me come back the next day, a mutual friend introduced us. John Mack was leaving, and I thought, that's who I was supposed to meet, and I shook hands with him and said, oh, I could have sat and talked with John Mack, and I go inside, and there's Lawrence. Well, I told Lawrence about my theories about uh, crop circles um, and, uh, and, and uh, the outbreak of mad cow disease in England, and I'll show you here. This is the first crop circle that has something more than a circle. It, it has a ring around the outside. So this is the first pattern of complexity. And this happened at a place called Cheesefoot Head in 1986 in the fall. And coincidentally, mad cow disease broke out in the cattle in the Cheesefoot Head area that late summer, early fall. And all through the 90s, um, as the crop circles become more and more complex, mad cow disease starts to spread all over England. And they didn't know what it was. I mean, prion disease wasn't discovered until 1996. 
1995, they also had a hoof and mouth disease, which is a really bad disease. Ranchers fear that more than anything than mad cow. Uh, but hoof and mouth disease before mad cow was the, it's so uh, contagious and you don't see outward signs of the disease. Uh, you can't tell if your animal has it and they spread it, it's really bad. So the combination of, of mad cow disease and hoof and mouth disease caused the English government to, to dictate that every single head of livestock in the British Isles was to be destroyed. So all through the end of 95 through 96, they killed 4.5 million head of cattle in England. As they were finishing up burning the last bodies, 4.6 million, uh, there's one of the slaughter pools. This crop circle was formed in less than 40 minutes in broad daylight. This is a real crop circle. And right as the last animals were being, um, were being killed, this really enigmatic crop circle uh, was created. And when I told Lawrence this, he was, he was pretty amazed. And I said, well, Lawrence, you know about prions, right? They didn't discover the, the, you know, what they were until the year after they finished killing all the cows and burning them. That's when they discovered that you can't kill the prions by burning cows unless you're burning them in, in a blast furnace. And he said, well, what happened to all the ash from four and a half million cows? I said, well, they sold it to 70 countries as fertilizer. <laughs> 20 year vegetarians are dying of Crutzfeld Jakob's disease in England. Okay, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if you want to give blood to the, you know, to the Red Cross, what's one of the questions they ask? Have you spent six months of your life in England between the years of 1986 and 19, uh, uh, 2000? And if you've spent six months in England, you cannot give blood. Did you know that? Okay, well, there's something going on here, uh, folks. And believe me, your government is not fessing up to what it is, okay? I mentioned all this to Lawrence, and uh, at the end of the second afternoon, we started to run out of things to talk about. You know, I, I, I was just trying to treat him like a regular guy, and he really was. He was a sweetheart. I mean, he got a, a master's of philosophy from Princeton and ran Japan after the war as a 20-something-year-old, and... You know, then I started asking, well, what about your family and eugenics and selective breeding? And, you know, what about, you know, I started asking some things, you know, a little more pointed questions off the paranormal stuff. And he was answering very honestly. And then I said, well, you know, this new thing called the Internet. You know, everywhere I go on there, people seem to think your little brother David is the Antichrist. And he, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and he turned blue and he started to freaking die. I mean, he, I thought I, was, I killed him. He was 87 years old, and he went apoplectic. They had to take him in, lay him down. They came out in a pretty stern voice, said, You're, you know, your time with Mr. Rockefeller is over. Goodbye. And I went home thinking I killed Lawrence Rockefeller with a joke. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making this up. Uh, so I was really, really upset uh, about that. And the woman who introduced me to him, she was going to ask him for money, and because he had this experience, he, he, he got better and they took him to his plane and he flew back to New York. She didn't get to ask him for the money, so she was pissed at me too. So I'm thinking, oh my God, I've just ruined this golden opportunity to you know, hang with a billionaire and, you know, and stuff. Well, I get a hand-delivered letter a couple of days later with a big fatty check in it. And I went, okay, maybe, maybe I didn't, you know, maybe it went up better than I thought. So, so he did fund me for two years. Uh, I'll be honest and fess up with that. Um, anyway, as I was saying, um, we are now dealing with a huge scourge of cattle mutilation cases in, uh, in South America. Uh, and also, uh, there have been cases in England that are constantly occurring there with horse slashing and sheep. And also, uh, the half-cat uh, mystery. Uh, tens of thousands of cats have been found around the western United States. It started in Brentwood in 1970, by the way where people find their little little puffy out, outdoors, clipped in half like with a giant pair of scissors, uh, with the back half usually missing. Um, all the major cities in the West have had these uh, outbreaks of these cases. Now they're in England. 
um, and it's a big deal there. They arrested some guy for copycat uh, activity, they think. Um, but, um, you know, this is, this. when I say un unexplained animal death, I mean, you know, I call them UADs, basically. I have to come up with an acronym, right? Um, I, I look at all animals. All animals have been found in a mutilated condition. Um, uh, you know, deer and elk and pigs and sheep and goats and horses. And, and uh, even we had uh, a case in the Dartmouth, uh, England Zoo of a wallaby getting mutilated. And then a couple of months later in the zoo in Jackson, Mississippi, a wallaby was found mutilated. Go figure. We had a buffalo mutilated inside a closed uh, pen uh, right at the base of, Mount, of Cheyenne Mountain in where NORAD is. And then a few months later, there was a, a, a cow found right in, at the doorway of the entrance to the underground uh, NORAD facility in, Mount, uh, in Cheyenne Mountain. So this is an all-pervasive thing. I hope I've at least kind of uh, put a little bug in your ear to think a little more creatively about this. I have a feeling we're going to go into a phase because of the pollution that's coming over from, from Fukushima. I do have a sense that we're going to see some mutilation activity west of the Rockies. I think it's already starting to take place. We've had a couple cases in Oregon, a case in Washington, some in Idaho. Um, wow, special effects. <laughs> you know, John, John Keel wondered uh, at one point if God was sane. Uh, and he, he thought UFOs are only here to confound us. Well, I, I think that uh, Gaia may have something to do with all this. And there's multiple groups with multiple agendas that are involved here. I've just really given you basically a, a Cliff Notes version of this. I have a two pound, 600 page book back there that goes into all this stuff in depth. Um, it shows all the outbreaks of cases by day, by week, by month, by year. Um, it's 12 to 15, 12 in three partial databases and 12 uh, complete databases for the first time have been all collated together. And I'm very proud of the book. Um, it's the really the go-to Bible and encyclopedia on this. And it goes into our relationship with cattle. It's very important to know where your food comes from. And as you know, I'm, I'm speaking to the to the choir here. I know in California, uh, where people are, are much more evolved and much more aware of what they put in their bodies and about the uh, the sanctity of our food and and um, and our nutrition. Uh, it's not so around the country. Unfortunately, most people shop on the inside aisles of the supermarket and, and eat all the processed food, which is the, the really detrimental to our health and our well-being. I really urge you all to be careful where you uh, get your beef from and, you know, pay twice as much, eat half as much. Um, it's very important because, like I said, this could be an emerging health crisis, and uh, I hope it's not. I hope the government is not monitoring the environment for mad cow disease. Uh, I hope it's just Satanists, uh, you know, doing it, uh, you know, to 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 appease Bezel, Bezelbub or Baphomet or whatever. Um, I, I don't think so. But uh, you know, next time you see an alien, ask them when they're going to return all the cows that uh, that they they seem to be taking. Um, you know, I could have gone into a lot of detail in, in 1971. Uh, they were taking the cattle. The, the cattle were being taken. Helicopters were being shot at by ranchers. 1972, we had no, not one single case. And then 1973 is when the whole mystery hit with a vengeance, and they figured out that if they leave the animal behind, there's plausible deniability. So anyway, I've really tried to uh, condense a <clears throat> 22 years of, of um, well, 25 years almost of... Uh, of research and investigation, and I'm going to open it up, excuse me, to some questions now, if anybody, unless I've solved all the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> Thank you.